is it possible for a muscle to like keep growing after like seven to 10 days after training it? That doesn't make a ton of sense because muscle protein synthesis, it seems that that is only elevated for 24 to 72 hours. So intuitively, it wouldn't make sense to me anyways for a muscle to keep growing like 10 days after training. But a new study that was highlighted by Mass, a research review by Eric Helms, Mike Zoros, and Greg Knuckles, looked at muscle growth, a delayed response in muscle growth. And basically what they did was study had 16 untrained adults, but three of them dropped out. So the study really looked at 13 different adults and they had two separate training blocks. Each block was five days long. The first three days of the five day training blocks, they had one session a day and they did four sets of leg extensions to failure. And then on the second two days of each block, they did the same thing for their training session, four sets of leg extensions to failure, and this was blood flow restriction training. And then they did it twice a day for the second two days of each block. So the first three days, one session a day of four sets of blood flow restriction to failure. And then the final two days of each block, they did that twice a day. And there was like 10 days between blocks to take different measurements and look at their muscle growth and stuff like that. And what they found was that Type 1 and type 2 muscle fiber growth, muscle cross-sectional area, actually decreased at first during that first block of the, their training cycle, but then increased throughout the duration of the rest of the study, and then kept increasing like 10 days following up that, that second training block. So there's a little bit of that delayed growth. But the whole cross-sectional area, it did not see that initial dip. It didn't decrease at first. It just kind of linearly increased throughout the study, but it didn't see that delayed response. So the whole muscle cross-sectional area did not follow the same trend of growth compared to the type one and type two fibers. So what the heck is going on here? Listening to the, the research review, like I, I read this study, I'm getting my master's degree in exercise science. I feel like I am capable of reading and at least getting my own interpretation of research. But I also want to listen to people with far more experience in this field than me. So listening to like Greg talk about this, one theory that he proposed was that in the whole cross-sectional muscle area, you're gonna have more extracellular swelling. You're gonna get some more edema, some more water in that whole muscle that you're probably not gonna get in just the type one and type two fibers. So when you initially start training, you get that swelling. So you might not see that that decrease that the type one and type two saw right away. And the type one and type two might've saw that decrease because they had untrained individuals take four sets of blood flow restriction training to failure once a day for three days and then twice a day for the following two days. The people that dropped out, there's a person that dropped out that thought they were like having onset of rhabdomyolysis. So this training was intense. So one could propose that when they started this training, it was just too much. And the catabolic processes, the, the muscle breakdown processes, resulted in a, a decrease in fiber size in those first, that first portion. But then they, they took advantage of that repeated about effect, which basically means that you're, you're going to be able to recover from a certain bout of training the more you do it. So they're able to recover better. And then they saw, saw that growth. So that's a potential explanation for why the whole muscle saw the difference in that trend compared to the type one fibers, why the type one fibers might have saw that saw that decrease right away, that kind of that swelling difference. But why would the, the type one fibers keep growing, but the whole cross-sectional area, the whole muscle cross-sectional area doesn't keep growing? It doesn't make sense that the, the individual fibers would grow, but the whole muscle wouldn't see that growth. Well, the potential reason for why it kept growing was because they also took markers of different anabolic signaling. So more than just muscle protein synthesis, there's other signaling going on here. So this anabolic signaling was the most elevated at like 10 plus days after training. So it's almost like there's this delayed adaptation to where the anabolic signaling was highest around this like 10 day point after training. So if anabolic signaling was highest, it still might result in some growth kind of in absence of this muscle protein synthetic response probably only lasting like 24 to 72 hours. But that still doesn't answer the question on why would that result in type one muscle growth and not whole muscle growth? Well, reading like Greg's and Eric's and hearing Mike Zordos, all of them talk about this, there didn't seem to be a great answer for this. And I don't think that there is. A theory that I have 
is that maybe the, the swelling, the edema in the whole muscle cross-sectional area went down in that 10-day period, but maybe there still was some of that, some of that fiber muscle growth, and maybe that just kind of canceled each other out for that whole muscle. So the swelling went down, but the fibers kept growing. But since the swelling went down, it made the cross-sectional area look about the same. So that's kind of the, the theory I have, why you might see that whole muscle might not change a lot, but the type 1 and type 2 fibers did. But what are the practical implications of this study? Well, one in implication is that since whole muscle cross-sectional area didn't really change much af after that you know, 3 to 10 day period, this delayed adaptation or this delayed muscle growth might not have a ton of practical significance and it might just be something that's kind of academic and cool to think about. Another takeaway is that muscle protein synthesis isn't the only thing that matters. There's these other anabolic and catabolic processes that can make a, a big difference in muscle growth. Think about it this way. If someone's super stressed out all the time and they have all these catabolic processes going on compared to someone that it is in high school and just hangs out with friends and does that sort of thing, who do you think is going to grow better? Probably the person that has more of these anabolic processes going on. And yeah, there's going to be individual difference, but if you're comparing the same person under a ton of stress versus the same person not stressed at all, my hunch would be that the person that's not having these life stresses would grow a bit better. So there's more than just muscle protein synthesis. Also, I think that this study suggests that it's important to gradually increase your volume over time and not start with any one steep increase because it did show that that initial decrease in cross-sectional area because it was probably just more than what they could handle. And another takeaway is that if you do overdo it in like a single week of training, you might see this delayed response in muscle growth. But is that better than just gradually increasing your volume and not kind of overdoing it? I would say it's probably not. I would say that over the, especially over the long term, that there's probably not going to be a big difference between just gradually increasing your volume, not, not like shooting for this super compensation. And I don't think it is a super compensation. I think it's more so we didn't grow here, but now that we actually have the recovery resources, we're going to make up for that a little bit rather than you're growing more because you did this. I think that if you gradually increased your volume over time, you would grow, 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 but then you might kind of stop growing and the growth might be a little bit similar, but with this kind of overreaching protocol, you might, you might risk injury or beating yourself up a little bit more than you have to rather than if you just kind of gradually increase it. So I think that the gradual increase will actually outperform this kind of this overreaching style a little bit more in the long run, in my opinion. Plus, it's difficult to really know if how to prescribe overreaching, like what what volume dose is a good amount to overreach, but still result in this potential delayed growth and what what's going to just be too much and not result in any growth. Like, What's going to result in injury? What what things are we considering here? It's it's difficult to prescribe because we don't have much research on it. And I think that it's almost like something that is a risky move that is for a maybe sort of potential benefit and probably not any better than just gradual increase. So right now, anyways, I don't think it has a great cost to benefit ratio. And the final takeaway is that Greg mentions in this study review that BFR training, blood flow restriction training, tends to like accumulate a bit more satellite cells. So somewhere in your year of training, it might not be a bad idea to have some sort of blood flow restriction training to incorporate a little bit more satellite cells. That is kind of out on a limb. I'll admit that. But just from a purely mechanistic standpoint, it might make sense to have like one mesocycle or one month a year to where you incorporate some sort of blood flow restriction. But then again, I'm really not sure if it's going to make a huge difference in the long run. So I hope you enjoyed this, took something away from it. Make sure to subscribe for more helpful videos like this and I'll see you in the next one.